Paul Falcone, welcome back to Engaging Leader. Jesse, I love being here with you. It's my pleasure. It's great to be back. Paul, what is the tough conversation with employees that people most ask you about? Oh, that's easy. Uh, attitude problems ah. all the time. That's what I'm always going to hear about is my employee has an attitude problem and I don't know how to deal with it. And it's been going on for years, et cetera, et cetera. So can I start with that one? Absolutely. Since it happens to be the most popular of all. <laughs> Um, and it's also the, the, the kind of the toughest one. So, so the one thing I'll tell you, Jesse, is this: what, what my experience has been. I've been in HR for 25 years, and I've been doing this stuff in entertainment and financial services and healthcare, biotech. I mean, kind of you know, people are people is the bottom line. <laughs> and you see these issues everywhere you go. It doesn't really matter education level. Um, it, it's just, there are self-awareness issues that some people just are not very good at. And when you manage someone like that, it can be very, very frustrating. So I understand where it comes from. That being the case, you have to know how to approach this stuff so that you can get the person. It, it, it initially starts verbally as more of a coaching session. Think of it as a professional development type of career development discussion. And if you do it that way, it's smart because you want to get the person to kind of buy in assume partial responsibility for the problem. I'm not telling them they're all wrong, but I want them to kind of raise their awareness level, at least for the conversation that we're having. And what I find is if you can get people to assume partial responsibility for a problem, they'll fix it. Mm. If they're angry, anger goes nowhere. Anger is it's your fault. It's not my fault. You're being too sensitive. And all of these excuses start to come into, into play. And so I think you need to do this privately, and I think you need to open it up a certain way. And, and, and one of the things that I would do is I would start off and I'd say, Michelle, I, I call this meeting because I need your help with something, which is fair, right? Yeah. Okay, she's listening. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like you to consider this more like a professional development, executive coaching type of meeting than anything else. Do I have your permission to just be totally transparent with you and bring something to your attention that may have missed awareness? or maybe missing awareness up to now in your career. And then they kind of give you that look of, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> right? right? And now you've got to kind of open into it. And then and, and the way I usually say it, Jesse, is, you know, they say perception is reality until proven otherwise. And, and I sometimes feel like you're mad at me or you're mad at the team, and I can't quite tell what's going to trigger it. And, and let me give you an example of what it looks like from my vantage point, Michelle, so that I can make it as concrete for you as possible. And then I want to talk about it and see if we can kind of get on the same page. So there's a lot of pieces in that opener. And I think what's really, really important is if they kind of get this, you know, sense of you're in trouble, I can't take this anymore. That's anger. Anger is always external. And when you, and when anger hits anger, it goes nowhere because someone, the, the person receiving it assumes 0% of the responsibility, puts 100% of the responsibility on you or someone else, but they're not taking any of it because they're in anger mode. So the first thing I always tell people is you've got to get them away from anger and towards its opposite, which is guilt. Now, guilt, I don't mean in the old sense of making someone feel bad about that. Guilt in the sense of a human emotion that helps people look inward and assume partial responsibility for a problem. That's really, really important in doing something like this. Um, and if you don't like the word guilt, don't use it. Use the word awareness, I'm fine with that too. But, but the reality is you have to get them to the point where they can say, okay, I kind of see where you're coming from, or I can admit that about myself. So if the anger is, Michelle, I can't believe you. I don't know, right, and it's all anger and it's all noise. If it's Michelle, we've got to talk about what happened in that meeting. It, I, honestly, it really hurt my feelings. It embarrassed me in front of the rest of the team. And I'm not sure what you were thinking, but I'll be honest with you. I mean, how would you feel if I had responded to you that way in front of the rest of the team? And, and just to let you know, I wouldn't respond to you that way because I respect you too much. But in that meeting just now, I, I, I really felt like it was inappropriate and I felt very, very awkward in front of the rest of the team. Now, typically, the Michelle in that, the initial reaction to that is going to be, oh, Paul, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to offend you. That's not what I was trying to do. I was just, okay, it's fine. As soon as you can get them to the point, Jesse, where you can tell them, oh, Paul, I'm sorry, that's not what I intended, they can assume part of the responsibility. And that's an important first step in all this stuff. You've got to pierce their heart. It doesn't help to get angry. And what most people do is, the, I always say, the path of least resistance is avoidance. 
and they avoid the confrontation and they just keep swallowing it. And then some proverbial straw is broken on the camel's back and kaboom, the whole thing blows up. Yeah. And by the time it comes to my office in human resources, when they tell me what it was, it's usually a fairly trivial issue. <laughs> then it's like, well, what, this caused all this, but the reality is they've been swallowing this for 30 years or three years or three months or three weeks or whatever it is. But all of a sudden something blows. And that's when it's like, come on, as a manager, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. And we learned that in the third grade. But a lot of times I understand that the confrontation is difficult. But th I'm sorry, that's why we're paying you the big bucks. You've got to be able to do this and do it in a constructive manner as possible. If you're really afraid that you have a litigious employee, don't necessarily do the meeting alone. You can have someone in there with you as a witness. And I'm fine with that too, another member of management or your boss. Maybe they get two tiers. They get their manager and the director, or they get the director and the vice president, or whatever. But what's important to me is, number one, that you're trying to get them to buy in, and this concept of guilt or awareness is a really important place to come from. The second thing I, I typically tell them, Jesse, in a situation like this is, you know, perception is reality until proven otherwise. So they used to call them PR firms. Now they call them perception management firms. But the idea is... It's not so much what your intention is or what you think you're doing. You are responsible for creating a friendly and, a, and an inclusive work environment, just like I am. And the reality is it's not so much what you think you're doing. It's really more a matter of how the other person is receiving that message. And sometimes, Michelle, it comes across as too harsh. And I'm not, again, you're not in trouble. This is not what this kind of meeting is. This is a meeting to raise awareness. Because so, and it's not even here for our company. I, I Really, the way I'm looking at this is, I hope you accept this as constructive criticism for the rest of your career, no matter where you go, because I don't want to see this kind of thing hold you back. Most people, no matter how bitter, angry, or chip on the shoulder-ish they tend to be, will listen to that. And even if they can't process it in the moment, because some people, it takes them a little more time, they can sleep on it. And they can probably come around. So the part of this that's so important is there's an empathy to it. There's this idea of holding people accountable for their own perception management um, and using a little bit of that sense of, you know, how would you feel if, if I had spoken to you in that tone of voice in front of the rest of the team? Or And, and let me clue you, um, spoiler alert, I wouldn't because I respect you too much, Michelle. And that's why I was really embarrassed in there and it hurt my feelings. I think if you can hold that kind of meeting, you can get them over to your side even for a moment. It, it's going to take some time. It's not a one and a done. This is a career development kind of conversation. You're probably going to need more. But the reality is, more importantly, you've set the right record in place by having that conversation so that if it happens again and you move to some kind of formal progressive discipline, the employee can't say he or she didn't know. So think about it in the sense of protecting yourself and protecting your company from unwanted liability. This is all part of a continuum, and it has to start with the coaching conversation and it has to then, if it doesn't get fixed, it has to progress to a documented discipline and ultimately to a termination. But someone's got to grab this bull by the horns. I don't care how many years and decades the person's been with a company. I don't care how many managers she swallowed up and spit out. It's got to stop somewhere, and you have to be that first domino. And that really is your responsibility. But that's the best way to approach quote-unquote attitude problems. Final thought on this, Jesse, is don't use the word attitude. If you tell someone you've got a bad attitude or if you document you've got a bad attitude, you're in trouble from the get-go because people see that as a fighting word. And if it's in your documentation, the courts won't even accept it. Courts throw that out and say, that's a difference in opinion. We're not, mm. You can't terminate someone for having a quote-unquote bad attitude. Instead, use terms like behavior, conduct. That's okay. You can talk about your behavior, Michelle, or your conduct. I wouldn't talk about attitude. If you put those words in your discussion or you put them on paper, you're going to be creating hardship for yourself a little later down the road. I like the the flow there. You know, you started with the concept of can you just get them to the point of partial responsibility? Or I like often like the word contr contribution. How, could, how did you contribute to the situation? Because most of us, even if we have no awareness that I'm to blame for anything, I, okay, I did contribute to some kind of a situation there, and and you can start to get them moving over toward empathy, where you would, you know, how, right. how would you feel if I treated you that way? And then the idea of image management, you know, Im image is perception is reality, and right. you know what, you know, can you see how 
your behavior has been contributing to the way other people's receiving you a certain way. And what can we do about that? Yeah, oh, that you're sounds ready. Like a good you, you, you got it nailed. You, you're good. I'm going to have you come into the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. You hit all the right things. Listen, there's no guarantees. Uh, the level of awareness that people have, you can't fix. But the reality is you can do the right thing by the employee because that's what this is. This really is a selfless leadership type of event where you're sitting with them and saying, I wouldn't be doing your service as your manager if I didn't bring this to your attention. On the other hand, you're also protecting yourself and the company by saying, I'm creating the right record to state that this conduct needs to move in a different direction. And if it needs to go to documentation at the next stage, then so be it. Uh, but she won't say, oh, I didn't know. Or if I'm going to bring this up on a performance review. The person can't say, oh, Paul didn't tell me. I, I want to make sure that my employees understand what they're being held accountable for. Don't just swallow it and look the other way. You can't keep sweeping stuff under the rug. It's going to drive you crazy. So, And if you really feel like you need help, have someone else in there. It could be HR. It could be your boss. I'm fine with that. But, but the reality is talk. We don't do enough of that in, in our society these days. We used to sit around the campfire, Jesse, pass around the peace pipe. The elders used to pass along the wisdom to the younger ones. That's been replaced by television, social media, and everything else. We don't sit around and talk enough. And I think this is a great example of how you can fix a perception problem like, you know, an attitude. Yeah, and it starts with having an actual conversation. What, what's another example of a common tough conversation to have with an employee? Okay, so my second one that I want to talk about is very similar along these lines. And it's a, it has to do with leering. Now, leering is a subset of sexual harassment. It's when you're staring at a coworker in a lewd lustful, um, sexually suggestive way. And the challenge with leering is that it's very easy for the person, if you bring it to their attention, they're going to say, I didn't do that. Yes. I've never done that. The other person is being too sensitive or they're making stuff up in their heads. I didn't do that, right? That's what you're going to get. And that's yes. why this is a good example. And I think when you have a meeting, I'm going to give a 30-second example here. I had an employee one time who was a shorter male with very thick glasses, kind of squinted, but I had a complaint from about four or five different women who came to see me. He says he does not speak to us by looking at us in the eyes. He looks at our breasts. Now, part of it is because he was a shorter man and he was probably, you know, when he looked straight across, he, he was looking at their breasts. He wasn't holding his neck up to look in their eyes. But the bottom line is it didn't matter. Yeah. So I called him in with his supervisor and I said, you are not in trouble. I don't want you to think you're in trouble. Um, I just need to make you aware of how you may be coming across because this may be missing awareness. And I said to him, I said, Bill, you've got to understand that when employees put me on notice that they're not comfortable with something, as your HR guy, I've got to do something about that. You would agree, correct? Well, sure, Paul. Okay, well, in this case, um, what I would tell you is this. There's sometimes a difference between perception and reality. What you as an employee here may feel is your reality maybe a different perception you're creating in the eyes of the people around you. So let me get to the point. A number of female employees have come to me and they've said, when Bill talks to me, he talks to my breasts. Bill, I'm not embarrassing you. I'm trying not to embarrass you, but I just want you to hear me through. Um, you may not realize you're doing that. They may be taller than you. I don't know, but you're responsible for the perception that you create. You're responsible for the feelings that other people have when they deal with you. And so one of the things I need you to do is I need to make sure that when you're talking to a female coworker, you're looking at the person's eyes, that you're not looking anywhere else on their body other than at their eyes. Can you make that commitment to me? And he said, yeah, Paul, I didn't realize I was doing that. I said, okay, I, I, that would make sense. I, I, and Bill, like I say, I have no reason to doubt your sincerity, but, but the reality becomes I need a commitment from you right now that you're going to do this and we won't have to have this kind of conversation again. Because honestly, it's not that comfortable for me either. <laughs> so if you can make that commitment right now, we'll be good as gold. And he said, of course I will. Shakes my hand and runs out of my office. <laughs> it's a scary meeting. Yeah. But the reality, Jesse, is like, look, I'm not blaming you and I can't say you did. But what I can say is others have perceived it and brought it to my attention. You know that I've, I've got to act on it, right? And for sure. And then from there, you can take it to a listen. I want to raise your awareness about the perception you're creating with others. And then if you can make this one adjustment and you'll commit to it so that we won't have to have this conversation again, we're golden, we're good. Usually it fixes the problem. And, and it did. It certainly did in that case. The poor man was always looking for eyeballs. No matter where he was in the building, he was like, where's the eyeballs? But, but that's really what happens. Once they're called on it, because look, when I say I don't doubt his sincerity, it's true. Maybe he didn't. 
but maybe he did. Mm -hmm. And I can't know that. I can't look at people's hearts. So the reality is I can set a workplace standard that says this is the standard going for. So, yeah. Sound good? That's great. Well, we have time for one more tough conversation. Okay. You got another example? Okay, I've got one more, and this is a quick one. Okay. This isn't so much what to say. It's how to handle a situation. And it's when an employee verbally resigns from your company and gives two weeks notice and how to handle a, a resignation. And in my book, 101 Tough Conversations to Have with Employees, it's number 101. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I open up that piece and I say, you're probably wondering why I've saved this for the end. And the reason why is because a lot of employers step on landmines and they don't even know it. When a problematic employee resigns, don't do the jig just yet. Mm. The, oh, they're leaving next Friday is going to be their last day. Yahoo. Because when that Friday morning comes, they may walk into your office and say, Jesse, you know what? I've changed my mind and I'm rescinding my resignation. And then the employer is like, incensed. What do you mean? I've accepted your resignation. No, today is your last day. And all the drama kicks in. The reality is you could get stuck as an employer with a wrongful termination lawsuit if you don't allow the person to rescind their resignation. And employers have looked at me, listen, I almost made that mistake wow. my, myself, so I learned this one the hard <laughs> way. Where, and my outside counsel cautioned me, and he said, Paul, listen, this is how it works. When someone gives notice, you have to act in reliance on their resignation. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, you can update their job description, you can post their job, you can distribute their job duties to their coworkers. You can begin interviewing outside candidates. And if you're lucky, you can hire someone in that two-week window. If you've done all those things, and that Friday the person says, I've changed my mind, you could say, well, we hired someone. It's too late. Sorry. And you'll be fine. But the mistake that employers make is they do nothing in that two-week window. Nothing at all. They don't post the job. They don't begin interviewing. They don't distribute the duties because they're busy doing other things. Now, again, normally, Jesse, this isn't a problem when you have a good worker. But when you've got a problematic worker, especially someone you think could be litigious, just remember you've got to act in reliance on that resignation and that two-week window. Get moving. That is your top priority is to get all those things in action, even if you haven't hired someone. And the person says, I'm rescinding my resignation. I want to stay. You're probably going to say, I'll get back to you. Let me call my lawyer. You can call the <laughs> employment outside counsel and say, listen, this is what I've done. The lawyer is going to say, well, what have you done? And you've done one, two, three, four, five. And the employer, the employment lawyer is going to say, look, from what you've told me, you're safe. You can tell him, thank you, but we're accepting the resignation as was originally planned and that he gave you. If you've done zero, don't expect, you know, don't be surprised if the lawyer says, you know what, Paul, you're really going to be taking a lot of risk. Because if he gets his foot in the door with a wrongful termination lawsuit, then comes discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and all those carry punitive damages. So the lawyer might say to be on the conservative side, you really should accept the resignation. You should re accept his res rescind, whatever the word is. Let him take his resignation back and keep him employed. And the reality, Jesse, is it does get scary. If an employer doesn't see this coming, you're going to step on that landmine and it's going to go kablooey and you're going to say, what's this world coming to? The answer <laughs> is, you know, common sense is not so common because people aren't put in these situations very often. And they don't teach the stuff in MBA school. When I wrote my books, all of my books, it was always to teach employers the how. They know what to do. They just don't quite know how to do it. So how to have that conversation, how to document, you know, whatever it happens to be. That's where I wanted my writing to kind of fill that gap. And hopefully it does. But these are those little kinds of things that in my world, 25 years in HR, I've seen these things. And that's what I've got to bring to people's attention. Yeah, that's just a, you're right. It's just a, a pitfall that most of us wouldn't even think about. Right, right. So well, there you go. There you have it. Fantastic. We've been talking about the book, 101 Tough Conversations to Have with Employees. Paul, can you show us the book and let us know where people oh. can get their hands on it? Sure, Jesse. Thank you. This is what it looks like. I'll put myself over there, right there. <laughs> And the book is published by HarperCollins, HarperCollins Leadership, and it's uh, with the American Management Association with Amicon Books. So the second edition just came out in 2019. So the um, book is doing very, very well, thank goodness. And uh, to me, I think it's, the, it's a fairly unique book because it really talks about every workplace situation you can imagine, from performance issues to conduct issues, attendance issues. Uh, compensation discussions when they come to you and say, well, I looked on salary.com and I should be making 25% more. It's like, how do you handle these things? Because these are real. Yeah. Even having counteroffer discussions or having to terminate or lay off, it's all in that book because it's really all about leadership defense. 
you have to know how to protect yourself and, and, and protect your company. Super helpful. And besides getting the book, where can people find out about you and your work? Thank you. Uh, I love a LinkedIn invitation. If anyone wants to send me a LinkedIn invitation, it's Paul Falcone, and you can find me pretty easily. Um, I also have a website at www.paulfalconehr.com. Probably not too much of a surprise. But <laughs> tons of articles. I've got PowerPoint decks. I've got a lot of fun stuff on the website. So there's a lot of material there if anyone wants to make use of it and download it. They're more than welcome. Fantastic. And for our listeners who didn't catch all those, we'll put the links in our show notes for this episode on our website at engagingleader.com. Paul, man, it's been great having you back on Engaging Leader. Thanks for joining us. Always, Jesse. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite.